And you understand what she meant to us. People called us monsters and freaks too. And I think we were beautiful freaks, weren't we? Just like her. Welcome to the Final Ghost Podcast, where we watch horror films and read horror books. This is Anna Bogutska, your podcast host. If this is your first time listening, we usually cover horror film history on this main feed and notable new horror releases over on the Patreon, where you can find us at patreon.com forward slash the final girls. Alongside our film and horror TV coverage, every month or so I interview some of the most exciting people who are writing horror right now under the banner Bloody Book Club. We're in between seasons here at the podcast, so I'm bringing you bonus Bloody Book Club episodes to tide you over. Some of these were recorded a little while ago, but are too good a conversation to leave in the drawer. In this episode, I talk to Samantha Allen, author of the absolutely hilarious and brutally gory horror comedy novel Patricia Wants to Cuddle. It follows the final four contestants on the reality dating show The Catch as they arrive on a remote island to film the very last episode. As people from the production start disappearing one by one, they realize that maybe there's someone else in the woods. A temperamental and misunderstood local living alone in the dark and desperate for a connection. Called the lesbian Sasquatch novel you've always wanted, How did they know that I've always wanted that? It is a phenomenally fun read. And if you're into gore on the screen or on the page, this one is for you. Samantha Allen is an award-winning journalist and this is her first novel. In our conversation, we talk about moving from writing journalism into fiction, her love of reality TV and the slasher influences on her book. You can find Patricia Wants to Cuddle in all good bookshops, and it is a perfect read for this spooky season. And with all of that said, please enjoy my conversation with Samantha Allen. Samantha, first of all, thank you so much for making the time to chat to me. Uh, I realized as soon as we joined the Zoom that it is extremely early where you are. So I appreciate you making the time even more. It's a fantastic way to start the day, in my opinion, (laughs) chatting with you. So congratulations on Patricia Wants a Cuddle. I I must admit, when I saw the cover, it instantly went on my, oh, I must read this. I too want a cuddle. Um, And it's just a roaring experience. I think I swam through it in about a day. I just could not let it go. That is high praise. I wanted it to be compulsively readable. And thank you, by the way, for seeing the proper British title of the book. In my opinion, Patricia wants a cuddle, which is, (laughs) you know, what I wanted it to be called um, overseas. they, they, they They kept the two from the American version. But after watching all the Love Island that I've consumed over the years, I wanted it to be Patricia Wants a Cuddle. I must admit that kind of escaped me and it must be because I've been in Britain for about a decade now that it's just attached itself to me. I've never seen a single episode of Love Island, so it's not coming from there. I'm obsessed with all the Love Island slang, proper fit birds, (laughs) putting people up for chats. And um, at the American publisher, uh, someone British worked at the American publisher Mm -hmm. and would always mistakenly call it Patricia wants a cuddle rather than Patricia wants to cuddle. So I still love Faber, even though they they didn't give me the A. I can imagine that would be a nightmare for SEO in a way, because just this one tiny change. But you know what? Let's make it Patricia wants a cuddle on this podcast. It's a way of rewriting history. Agreed. <laughs> so Samantha, I love to ask all of my um, guests on the on the show, what is your personal relationship with horror, be that books or film or any other format? Yeah. So um, I think I think film was the entry point for me, as I imagine it is for a lot of people. I was raised in a Mormon family, so we weren't allowed to watch rated R movies as children and 
when that happens, the taboo becomes exciting to you. So what did I want to watch when I snuck into the basement? But like, you know, the weirdest, goriest, strangest. Uh, stuff I could get my hands on. I, I would say my parents allowed us to watch Hitchcock, though. And so, like, you know, Psycho, Vertigo, Rope, those were all, like, really compelling early watches in kind of horror, horror-adjacent genre. Um, but then I, I would say I, like, kind of re-delved into it in my 20s after I, I saw The Descent Yes. And that really made an impression on me. Um, I love the way that it explores kind of relationships between women by taking a group of women and putting them in a cave and exposing them to uh, monstrosity and otherness. And that inspired just like a long, what has now become like a lifelong uh, obsession with horror films. You know, I've gotten back through the catalog. Um, I love slashers, especially mm. now. Um, the Friday the 13th movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street films. I really love, you know, Slumber Party Massacre and Sleepaway yes. Camp and Black Christmas. T to my mind, it's like, you know, I think when I first started dabbling in it, I was like, oh, I like elevated horror movies. And then <laughs> the longer I started watching them, I was like, mm, I like the trashy, gory stuff, too, <laughs> because one, it's fun. And two, I think it also has things to say that are just mm -hmm. as interesting as, you know, the A24 fair. Um, I'm being... I'm giving you a very long-winded answer, but no, I, you know, I do love reading horror books as well. I got into kind of Shirley Jackson mm. after a while. G Grady Hendrix's mm. horror comedies were obviously like an influence on Patricia's tone. Uh, yeah, I just, I love when bad things happen <laughs> <laughs> to fictional people. I love that summary of, I love when bad things happen. It's like that. Yeah, that's exactly why we're all horror fans. We just like seeing terrible things happen to fictional people. Yeah. And I mean, you know, life is horrific. So I feel like, why are we pretending? Yeah. Well, at least a horror movie is t horrific and entertaining as well. But going into your book, can you tell me what's the origin point of Patricia wants to cuddle? You know, is it was it a particular scene? Was it um was it a particular character or what was the genesis of it? Yeah, so I I love reality television. I think for similar reasons that I love horror, I think it it shows you like society at its seams almost and society at its most violent you know in horror movies it's people getting slashed to death and in reality tv it's people i don't know getting drinks thrown in their faces or <laughs> stuff like that but it, it just kind of shows you people on the edge right mm -hmm. um and so I'm a big fan of The Bachelor, which started in the States, but has since spread to multiple territories. And, you know, I was watching The Bachelor and kind of realizing, like, this has the same structure as a slasher movie. Like, women are getting eliminated one by one until only one is, you know, deemed worthy enough to remain and that might be a happy ending or an unhappy ending depending on what you think of the person she's ending up with um and so it seemed kind of like a, a no-brainer to combine like an elimination style reality tv format with like a slasher mm -hmm. format and in early incarnations of the idea and, you know, I, I, I was, it was very satirical in tone, which Patricia still is. And I, I was just having a hard time figuring out who the killer should be and how mm -hmm. grounded the book should be. And I don't know if we, how deep we want to get into it, but I, I decided I needed something kind of more mythical, mm -hmm. larger than life to really kind of 
make it pop and make the symbolism of it pop Mm -hmm. as opposed to just having like, I don't know, the murder turn out to be an ex-contestant or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I don't think this is a spoiler for the book. Correct me if you if you think uh, I'm wrong. But, you know, even from the very cover of the of the novel you kind of get you get a sense of who patricia is uh even though i i love kind of the the synopsis describes her as a temperamental and misunderstood local living alone in the dark woods so can you tell me a little bit about how you settled on on patricia and it feels disrespectful to say what she is like on who she is Yeah, I would say, you know, you can look at either uh, the American cover, the UK cover, both have a furry creature at different (laughs) levels of Zoom, I guess I would say, um, on them. And to me, you know, like when I was toying with the idea of having like a human killer as opposed Mm. to a furry killer, I was like... (laughs) Not not furry in that sense, furry in the literal sense. Um, I I was I was struggling with this notion of like, okay, this is fun, it's a good concept, but what am I really saying? You mm-hmm. know, um, sure I would like watch this on Netflix, but like would would I remember it? You know, mm-hmm. w- would it would it speak to me? And to me, like part of the reason I love watching a show like The Bachelor, a show like Love Island as a, you know, a queer person is like, to me, it's like this almost parodic display of like heterosexuality and heteronormativity. You just like see how much effort goes into the construction of like straight femininity. Like I often think about like, how many hours a day must be spent with like Dyson air wraps, like <laughs> before any of these women ever like appear on camera, hmm. um, you know, and, and this is one of the central critiques of queer theory is that like something that is presented to us as like uh, this like natural fact of the universe and used as a cudgel against queer people is in fact artificial, elaborately Mm -hmm. constructed, performative, you know, it's all the points of Judith Butler's gender trouble, right? And so I wanted like a monster who kind of like cut through all that noise. Mm -hmm. So to me, Patricia is like everything, you know, a standard like bachelor contestant might be afraid of being you know she is she is tall she is hairy she is ugly um and yet she has a life it's just a life differently ordered than theirs and Mm -hmm. some might say a more beautiful and authentic life in ways even though on the surface the way that she looks is horrific to them um, and that's kind of how I arrived at Patricia. It's really wonderful to hear you describe this journey to get to her, because even as you were saying it, you know, is she the monster of the book? Reading it, uh, about halfway through, I was genuinely wishing for every single character that, and particip- like participant and producer of the catch, the the fictional uh, dating reality show that that is at the center of your of your book, um, I I was just wishing them all to be killed at the head of Patricia or any other uh, circumstance. And I was wondering, kind of, you know, you mentioned before, kind of this um, the descent and kind of women being thrust into a. Uh, uh, forced in an enforced kind of cohabitation and then being confronted with themselves and with something, you know, other or monstrous. How did you calibrate how far to push your human characters? Yeah, it's an interesting question. They were, they're all kind of like stock characters in terms of reality television archetypes oh. and they all started out that way for sure you'll have to give me a primer <laughs> because i literally have never seen a dating a dating show like this well there's there's uh most people who appear on reality television in the states at least are like 
pretty deeply religious, whether mm. or not it's like depicted on the show or not. So Lila May was my prosperity gospel Christian influencer. Um, Amanda is more of my like fashion vlogger. Vanessa is kind of the pick me girl that I'm not like other girls. Pick mm. me is uh, my Gen Z editor had to teach me um, <laughs> the, the term pick me. Um, yeah. So I and Renee is kind of more more nuanced, more mm -hmm. of a reader stand in. Um, and. Yeah, so I started them all out as as more archetypal, but my goal in writing them was to flesh them out and make them more sympathetic, up right up until the point that they're they're brutally murdered. So like, I wanted you to start out making making fun of them and then be begrudgingly be like, but I actually kind of like Vanessa a little bit, or like I can see where these character traits of hers that I find so problematic might have come from in her life or that kind of thing. And then boom, executed. And to <laughs> me, that was just like, I don't know, it was fun. It, mm -hmm. Because there's a version of this book where like they're all they all stay flat and I just make fun of them the entire time and then kill them. But that felt too cruel to me. I I don't know. Yeah. And and kind of, you know, you've also mentioned kind of the influence of Grady Hendrix and kind of this the the horror comedy tone. Uh and it is, it's funny, but I have to say the scenes of horror are extremely graphic and very brutal and very visual. And I say this as a compliment to you when you're writing. Can you tell me about kind of finding this balance between making it funny and then reminding us that this is a horror story? Yeah, it's certainly, I would say, risky and challenging to write cross genre like this. Um, it's definitely something I thought about a lot while writing it, although maybe not as much as people might think, because like, this feels just authentic to me. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like I felt like, oh, I had my horror over here on one mm -hmm. side and my comedy over here on the other side. And I was like, blending the paints together or whatever. Like, it just kind of feels like a, I, I feel like a lot of this comes from just queerness and like, queerness at having to laugh at like the horror of the world like mm -hmm. in order to survive and so like when I write fiction this is just kind of like the tone that comes out of me and then I mm -hmm. find myself retroactively making justifications for kind of uh pushing things together I would say like comedy is a fantastic relief release valve for horror you know there's mm -hmm. nothing like cinematically or in or in literary fiction i i guess like something brutal happens and then there's like a joke or a wry remark or a satirical observation that just kind of lets the tension out of it um it was important to me though for it to be gory and bloody because mm -hmm. it's serving a metaphorical and figurative purpose like reality television is very figuratively violent in terms of we're taking these real people, making them sign release forms, and then literally kind of just like tearing them apart for our amusement, dissecting them on message boards, you know, digging through their entire lives and social media histories. And so to me, like I wanted literal visceral violence to reflect the figurative violence of mm -hmm. heteronormativity and of, you know, the reality television production complex, right? Like it needed to pop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say that like, as a result, Patricia has definitely found readers who have not really experienced horror in quite this way before. Oh. And that's, that's always an interesting um that's always an interesting observation to make. You know, I know, like, I know some people feel mm -hmm. the ending is, like, abrupt. But to me, that's, like, that's how horror ends. Like, everybody's dead and the credits roll. Like, <laughs> we don't get to stick around and hang out uh -huh. and 
see what people are up to at the most you get like a little epilogue or a little stinger that hints that the monster is still out there but i i sort of love the spartan efficiency of horror in that respect um we're done we're done here we've shown you what we need to show you goodbye get out of the theater <laughs> And that's actually quite interesting. I'm always intrigued by, you know, people's reactions to a piece of creative work. What has been some of the reactions from readers uh, that have surprised you or moved you? I would say, like, the reviews and reactions that I find the most moving are the people who see that there's actually like tremendous sentiment in the book as well. Like there's a lot of horror and it's very funny in my (laughs) humble opinion. I think it's funny. (laughs) Um, I would. Yeah. But there, there's an authentic core to it. I didn't want it to feel like empty or, or hollow. Mm -hmm. Um, There are letters as interstitials throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my my protagonist is is really grappling with um, queerness and frankly, like struggling to find a meaning or purpose in being alive. Um, mm-hmm. And those are all, you know, things that that I think about on a daily basis. Right. And so I I'm most moved by the readers who kind of were clued into the emotion of mm. the book as well. Um, Cause it is very much grappling with like in, a, in our like modern digitally mediated world, how is it even possible to like feel or encounter something real anymore? Mm. <laughs> um, which yeah, is to me another thing that Patricia symbolizes is kind of like the loss of, things that feel tangible and actual um, or yeah. you know real um which is a, a slightly abstract word but if it taps into real emotion especially if you are like like your protagonist like renee and the book is uh you know straddling this world of supposed reality tv that is all completely fake and she's participating in that fakeness uh and it, th- a lot of those you know relationships are the ones that are on screen at least are so mediated negotiated and uh, you know manipulated that it, the idea of what's real what isn't what's real emotion what's real attraction and what isn't is just completely shot out of whack because you can't really uh, i think that kind of sense of confusion really came quite strongly for me out of the book where she wasn't until she meets patricia she wasn't sure what was you know an emo what was true and what wasn't yeah, and it that's so I wanted Patricia to kind of force that reckoning for everyone. Like some mm-hmm. people will encounter this monster in the woods and find it a clarifying almost spiritual experience and other mm-hmm. people will encounter Patricia and want to run or um you know scream and tear and that to me was about like where where is this character and in their lives, what are they dealing with, and and how would the sight of something so surreal mm-hmm. affect them? <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, and you know, the setting of this kind of remote Pacific Northwest island to me is sort of this like fantasy of being able to escape. I mean, it's based on a real place, but like, oh really? You know, what place? They, It's called Orcas Island. Mm -hmm. Um, It's in the San Juan Island chain uh, in uh, the Pacific Northwest between Washington State and British Columbia. It's gorgeous there. Orcas in real life is much more uh, luxurious and less dilapidated than Mm -hmm. Otters Island. I had to give it kind of what I've described as a Texas Chainsaw Massacre make under. Like I had to kind (laughs) of... rust out some cars and stuff but Mm. um yeah you know i i i i love going there but i when i go there i realize i'm participating in like a fantasy of like a life i 
I can never and will never have, you know, Mm -hmm. at my age, I'm 36 now. It's like, I remember like being a kid and like mixing like shampoo and perfume and holes that I dug in the backyard. And it was like real. And I had my hands in the dirt and I was like, uh, you know, I had never seen a URL in my life and like, and now, you know, um, everything that happens in my life is mediated through a screen and it yeah. is sad to me on a macro scale that like these wealthy post-industrial societies took, I don't know, all of the unethical spoils of becoming wealthy industrial, <laughs> post-industrial societies. And we're like, you know what we want to do with this? We want to all just look at things on glowing rectangles forever. <laughs> like, how <laughs> depressing is that? <laughs> well. Yeah, that's certainly put a downer to our conversation. So well <laughs> but um, I, I did want to ask you about um, about Renee. Kind of, can you? You know, she's she is the most. You know, without disparaging the other characters, who, as you say, are kind of more. You know, stemming from archetypes of reality TV personalities. Renee is very much the emotional center of the story, and kind of a a lot of the a surrogate for the reader, really going into this world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about developing her as a character and especially kind of the that moment of clarity that she gets when she meets Patricia? Yeah, there have been a few contestants now on um, The American Bachelor, at least, who have come out as bisexual or queer, like following mm-hmm. their seasons. I think most prominently and most recently, um, a woman named Becca Tilly is dating the pop star Haley Kiyoko. Um, and, you know, like no indication, at least um, visibly on her season that like she was queer and mm-hmm. just statistically and with generational change, like it's obvious that there are LGBTQ people on these shows, um, mm-hmm. wh- whether or not the formats allow for that um, and whether or not they're comfortable being out at the time, just like statistically, uh, they've got to be there. <laughs> and so to me, yeah. Renee started as a way of first imagining, well, what would it be like to be struggling with or thinking about your own queerness mm-hmm. when you're on a show that has absolutely no room for it? What might that struggle look like? How might you relate to your contestants, fellow contestants, especially if you have a crush on one of them? And also, like, what might it look like to be on one of these shows and kind of not even almost know why you're there? You know, some mm. people get nominated uh, by their friends or or some people will sign up on a lark almost or they'll just be between things or they'll just want a change in their life. And so those to me are the edge cases I find most interesting because most people are going on for social media stardom and so to me yeah renee it was interesting to kind of pair her struggle with her queerness with yeah just kind of like struggling to figure out what she even wants out of the experience so to me she was you know a great foil for these characters who are, are all very clear about what they want um out of the show but i think also just a more accurate reflection of where myself and i imagine a lot of readers might be in this current Mm. moment of like, where do we fit in in this, you know, social media driven world and attention economy? I particularly appreciate that your your hair one of your hairless cats is climbing all over you as you talk about the attention economy. (laughs) Yes. People (laughs) warn you that hairless cats are like part parrot. (laughs) <laughs> um, but they apparently mean that literally because they love to just like climb on you and <laughs> on your shoulder. You know, I wanted to ask you as well about your background as a writer, because you, you've got this really impressive career in journalism. So kind of come from a very um, journalistic and scholarly kind of nonfiction world. Can you tell me kind of how, you know, how does that, how did that serve you moving into fiction and to novel writing oh gosh 
So, I mean, to me, Patricia is me like uh, coming out as a weirdo, you know, like I had the idea for this book long before my uh, I wrote my nonfiction book, Real mm-hmm. Queer America, which is a memoir travelogue of LGBTQ communities in conservative parts of the United States. But, you know, I, I love to write and getting into journalism was a way mm. to just like keep writing, frankly. And I I find I find meaning and purpose in that side of my career, certainly. To me, I always wanted to make something weird and messy and beautiful, which, you know, you can do in nonfiction, but to me, like fiction was how I wanted to like express that that side of myself and that side of my craft. So, you know, just with the way the industry is structured to get into publishing, you have to be like, well, this is very adjacent to what I do. So let me write a book about it, which is why, you know, I start out with nonfiction and real Mm -hmm. queer America and that thing is, you know, a national LGBTQ reporter. I didn't feel like I could come out of the gate, talk to publishers and be like, let me write a murder reality TV novel. Really? I mean, maybe I could have, and I was just letting, I don't know, a lack of self-belief diminish me. But I wanted, I guess, to Mm. walk through the door that felt more open to me, which was, you know, writing this, writing this memoir. And then after I did that, you know, I was like, well... I I need to kind of actually do the scary thing now and take mm-hmm. the big left turn. And that's, yeah, that's how Patricia came about. What was the biggest change for you creatively that was a writer? Or if, was there even one? I would say I, I've, I've since written um, more fiction. I just completed a draft of a, a another novel. Oh, amazing. Um, Congratulations. Oh, Thanks. And it it went much smoother than Patricia, uh, which I would say, like, when I first started writing Patricia, I was still having to get over the fact of, like, these aren't real people, (laughs) you know? I had, I had, like, profiled however many, you know, dozens of people in my career and real queer America. I traveled across the country and met and interviewed, you know, three, four dozen people and tried to create this kind of like collective portrait of like queer conservative state experience in the United States. And so I'd gotten very used to describing people who actually existed Mm. into me, um, you know, having, having fictional characters, it felt almost like cheating. Like, how can I like just make people up? Um, But that is of course, (laughs) what what one does in fiction um so yeah a lot of like a head games of like well renee doesn't exist but let me pretend she exists and then describe her as though she exists and then she'll be real (laughs) without spoiling anything about what actually happens at the end the way that i read the book was that everyone who is left gets a happy ending and that felt, you know, maybe that was not the intention, but that's the way I read it. I was happy for everyone who survived. Was it your intention to kind of essentially end it on a on a positive note? I would say I wanted to leave it somewhat open to interpretation, but my personal interpretation is mm-hmm. that the people who are left are happy with the choices that they have made. I would say like an an influence on the ending for me is the ending of Midsummer, the Ari Aster film, where you have a character who's left in this place and has seen horrific life altering images flash before their eyes, but instead of running from it has sort of come to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And I I would say that ending is maybe a little bleaker than mine in some respects, just in terms of where the character is left. But yeah, to me, like that was, that was kind of the vibe. That's a perfect comparison, actually. Although, yeah, much, much more uplifting, I'd say, in the case of Patricia. 
Uh, yeah, my characters had been through enough already by the end. Could it before before I let you go to get on with your morning, I did want to ask you, what would you like readers to take away from Patricia Wants to Cuddle? I wanted to be able to function on multiple levels at once, which was definitely part of the design of it. I wanted it to be something that someone could pick up, read in a sitting or two, and be like, well, that was bonkers and fun. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I certainly won't forget that reading experience and just set it down and go on with their lives. And a few years later, like chuckle thinking about my, you know, my little furry Patricia out there in the woods. Um, and then I also wanted it to be a book that like, you know, someone could sit with and think about the themes of and think about their own lives and think about social media and television and heteronormativity and all of these, you know, big $5 words and take something deeper away from it. So yeah, I would say like, it depends on not the, just the reader, but also like the mood, like, and to me that comes from horror. I I feel like horror is very much a get what you want to take what you want out of it kind of experience. You know, you can mm. watch Black Christmas and be like, well, there was some cool gore and some cool kills and mm. goodbye. Or you can watch Black Christmas and be like, this has something really interesting to say about like, womanhood in in the 70s and um <laughs> what what we fear and what society wants us to adhere to and you know like to me i wanted patricia to have that dual layer fun or or deep or both samantha thanks so much for your time uh i've really enjoyed this and really appreciated you expanding more on the ideas and the influences behind the book Thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat to chat with you. And for anyone listening, where can they find more of your work online? Oh, gosh. I guess <laughs> Twitter is a hellhole right now. I'm on there, SLA Writes, um, W-R-I-T-E-S. Uh, but mostly, I guess I use Instagram these days, given the shape mm -hmm. of Twitter. And I'm at N-E-E-B-E-S-S -E -E -S on Instagram, Nebess. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. 